He also learned that most of the research subjects avoided taking action for fear of getting into a heated argument, which they assumed could lead to even more problems. Personal characteristics. Influence masters look to the environment and ask, what other sources of influence are acting on this person? What's causing this person to do that? Since this person is rational but appears to be acting either irrationally or irresponsibly, what am I missing? You can answer these questions only by developing a more complete view of humans and the circumstances that surround them. Welcome back to the flight. Hit that subscription button, buddy, and stay updated with everything that's trending in Guyana and the diaspora. Thanks. For many people, it takes a while to become upset, smug, or self-righteous. In fact, when we began studying confrontations 25 years ago, we learned that the vast majority of the subjects we observed were inclined to walk away from broken promises, failed expectations, or bad behavior. When we asked the subjects why they backed off, they explained that it was usually better not to deal with issues the first time they occurred. After all, many of those problems were anomalies. They weren't likely to be repeated, so why make a big deal and come off as a micromanager? Although there may be some truth to this, we also learned that most of the research subjects avoided taking action for fear of getting into a heated argument, which they assumed could lead to even more problems. Who could blame them for going to silence? However, it's not as if choosing silence were a product of scientific inquiry. We back away from people because we conclude that they're selfish or rotten. Then we act on that conclusion as if it were the truth. Who's going to approach these folks? They're selfish and rotten. Therefore, we opt to stay silent. No matter what the reason is, walking away from violated expectations and broken promises can be risky. When you see a violation but move to silence rather than deal with it, three bad things happen. First, you give tacit approval to the action. If you see an infraction and say nothing, the other person can easily conclude that you've given permission. You may feel that you've given permission, and then, realizing that you've given the action the green light, you find that it's harder to say something later. Second, others may think that you're playing favorites. Hey, you never let me get away with that kind of stuff. Third, each time the other person repeats the offense, in part because of your failure to confront it, you see the new offense as evidence that your story about his or her motives was correct. You continue to tell yourself ugly stories, you fester and fuss, and it's only a matter of time until you blow. Violence Eventually, as problems gnaw at you, there comes a time when you can stand it no longer. You leap from silence to violence. A person interrupts you in mid-sentence for the hundredth time, and you finally blow a gasket. Your assistant misses an important deadline for the hundredth time, and you come unglued. Of course, you may not become physically violent, but you do employ debating tactics, give people your famous stare, raise your voice, make threats, offer up ultimatums, insult the other person, use ugly labels, and otherwise rain violence on the confrontation. Surprised by your sudden and unexpected eruption, the other person thinks that you've lost all touch with reality. Where did that come from, he or she wonders. But alas, the other person knows the answer. You did it, he or she concludes, because you're stupid and evil. You've now helped the other person commit the fundamental attribution error about you, which feeds that person's silence or violence, and the cycle continues. The solution, tell the rest of the story. Since the problem of coming up with ugly stories and suffering the consequences takes place within the confines of your own mind, that's where the solution lies as well. Effective problem solvers observe an infraction and then tell themselves a more complete and accurate story. Instead of asking, what's the matter with that person? They ask, why would a reasonable, rational, and decent person do that? By asking this humanizing question, individuals who routinely master crucial confrontations 
adopt a situational as well as a dispositional view of people. Instead of arguing that others are misbehaving only because of personal characteristics, influence masters look to the environment and ask, what other sources of influence are acting on this person? What's causing this person to do that? Since this person is rational but appears to be acting either irrationally or irresponsibly, what am I missing? You can answer these questions only by developing a more complete view of humans and the circumstances that surround them than the traditional, what's wrong with them. And if you do amplify your situational view, not only will you gain a deeper understanding of why people do what they do, you'll eventually develop a diverse set of tools for orchestrating change. Consider six sources of influence. To help expand our view of human behavior, we've organized the potential root causes of all behavior, including failed promises, into a model that contains six cells. Cell 1. Pleasure or pain. We already know the first cell. It's the one that, considered alone, makes up the fundamental attribution error. People base their actions on their individual motivation or disposition. Does the action motivate? Does the person enjoy the action independent of how others think or feel? Does it bring pleasure or pain? That's the model we already have in our heads, and it's partially true. People do have motives. Human beings do take pleasure in certain activities, and it could even be true that they enjoy making us suffer. However, this model is also the source of influence that gets us in trouble when it's the only factor we consider. Cell 2. Strength or Weakness We can double this simple model by adding individual ability. We now have two diagnostic questions. Are others motivated to do what they promised? And are they enabled? Does the action play to a person's strength or weakness? Does he or she have the skills to do what's required? By expanding the model from one to two cells, we acknowledge the fact that people not only must want to do what's required, they also need the mental and physical capacity to do it. For instance, maybe your company's customer service agents aren't returning calls to hostile clients because they don't know how to diffuse the hostility. Perhaps nurses aren't using protective gloves consistently because they can't put them on quickly enough. With two options to choose from, we also have another story to tell ourselves. Rather than judging others who violate an expectation as unmotivated and therefore selfish and insensitive, we add the possibility that maybe they actually tried to live up to their promises but ran into a barrier. Cell 3. Praise or Pressure From the way adults talk, you'd think peer pressure disappears a few weeks after the senior prom. We constantly warn our children against the insidious forces wielded by their friends Yet rarely do we consider the fact that those forces aren't switched off in some mystical ritual when we finish high school. Adult peer pressure may be less obvious than its teenage counterpart, but it's no less forceful. For instance, what do you think will happen if the supervisor of the software testers walks up to one of them and says, Hey Chris, we're running behind schedule. Could you hurry things along? What do you mean? Chris asks. You know, maybe finesse the final tests. The software seems to be running smoothly. And with that simple request, the tests are dropped. Is the other person being influenced by peers, the boss, customers, family, or for that matter, by any other human being? Should it surprise us that most of the ridiculous things both children and adults do are a result of simply wanting to be accepted? Healthcare professionals violate standards, scientists turn a blind eye to safety, accountants watch their peers break the law, and nobody says anything. Why? Because the presence of others who say nothing causes them to doubt their own beliefs, and their desire to be accepted taints their overall judgment. Peer pressure is the mother of all stupidity. Cell 4. Help or Hindrance in addition to motivating you to do things, other people can enable or disable you. They're either a help or a hindrance. 
for you to complete your job, your co-workers have to provide you with help, information, tools, materials, and sometimes even permission. Unless you're working in a vacuum, if your co-workers don't do their part, you're dead in the water. For example, what about the software engineers? What if their testing package failed? What if the person responsible for keeping the server online went off to a technical seminar and didn't keep them up and running as long as needed? Who knows? Maybe that's why the software is giving final assembly fits. That is the whole point of this discussion. Who knows? We're going to have to gather data. Cell 5. Carrot or Stick How do things motivate us? That's simple enough. Money motivates people, that we know. Guess what happens when money is aimed at the wrong targets? For instance, managers are rewarded for keeping costs down, and hourly employees are rewarded for working overtime. They're constantly arguing. Quality specialists earn bonuses for checking material and production employees for shipping it. They too seem to have trouble getting along. Maybe a team building exercise will reduce the tension. Perhaps conflict resolution training will help. Yeah, right. When they explore underlying causes, experienced leaders quickly turn to their formal reward system and look at the impact money, promotions, job assignments, benefits, bonuses, and all the other organizational rewards are having on behavior. It is sheer folly to reward A while hoping for B. Savvy leaders and effective parents get this. Here's how this concept applies to a community example. One of the greatest challenges in influencing at-risk youth in inner-city areas is that the models of successful careers that they see often involve the sale of illegal drugs. It isn't just the influence of others that lures them into illicit trade, it's financial. Until they see clear alternative pathways to financial well-being, thousands of young men and women will be lost to this social cancer. Frustrated couples are no less strongly affected by this powerful source of influence. The foundations of thousands of marriages continue to erode as one or both spouses give their hearts to careers that promise increased status or rich rewards to those who pay the price. Cell 6. Bridge or Barrier When it comes to ability, things can often provide either a bridge or a barrier. For example, imagine you're trying to get the people in marketing to meet more regularly with the people in production. They currently avoid each other like the plague because they don't get along. You've aligned their goals and rewards, but marketers still call production folks thugs and production specialists call marketers slicks. You believe that if you can get them in the same room once in a while, many of their problems will go away. But how? What will it take to get them to meet more often and eventually collaborate? First, you write an inspiring memo. Nothing happens. Then you add interdepartmental collaboration to the company's performance review form. Nada. Next comes a speech, then veiled threats. And finally, you create an award program that honors the collaborator of the month. You tell the various division's heads to nominate an employee for the award and they argue endlessly about who should win. Now you decide to do some out-of-the-box thinking, only this time it's out-of-the-cash-box thinking. The heck with rewards, it's time to turn to other things. Could you do something to the physical aspects of the organization that would allow people to interact more easily and more often? Yes, you could. In fact, if you want to get the two groups to meet more often, think proximity. When it comes to the frequency of human interaction, proximity, the distance between people, is the single best predictor. Individuals who were located close to one another bump into each other and talk. When it comes to work, people who share a break room or resource pool tend to bump into each other as well. Move the marketing offices closer to the work floor, throw in a common area, and the two warring groups may warm to each other. Proximity, or the lack thereof, has an invisible but powerful effect on behavior. Mm-hmm. So the proximity of people. Sometimes people act in particular ways because of their closeness to others. 
You see, sometimes if a person was more closer to you or they wasn't as far away behind a screen or a touchpad, keyboard, maybe we might deal with these situations differently. You know, we might be more slow to anger. But the thing is this, slow to anger, but silent sometimes might say approval. Some, sometimes we might stay silent on a matter and people might think that, yo, she's okay, he's okay with the way that I'm doing that. But it only get worse if we left it unchecked sometimes. So sometimes it's best for hold your silence, but then sometimes you just got to check things. But checking it in, in what way, checking it in what particular actions, how you're checking it, the conversations that you're going to have with the person, the crucial confrontation that you're going to have with the person. What is that going to be like? Hmm? And this is the insights that we gain from this book. And I need everyone that's watching the video to like it up, like it up, hit the like button and make sure that this video gets out into the world and into the algorithm in its best possible way. Thank you. I need everyone to make sure that they hit that like button and send this one out in the algorithm. I appreciate you. Thanks. Some people are grown children. Some people are just dealing with peer pressure. Some people just want to be accepted by their followers. Some of us, listen man, we only deal from the perspective of pain or pleasure. And some of us have weird ways in which we find pleasure. Some of us find pleasure in making others feel a particular way. Some of us find pleasure in helping other people. What's your pleasures and what's your pains? What's these crucial conversations that you might be missing in your life? What's some of the crucial conversations that you're going to have? And what's some of the crucial conversations that you had in the past that when you check yourself, you say, man, look, I could have do that better. Thanks for watching. And if you like videos like this, remember, hit the like button. Hit the like button so that I know that you appreciate it. And I'll do more content like this. And we'll keep this daily read going every single day. One love. She's ready. Stay ready. Mr. The ultimate male supplement. Men's total wellness formula. Packed with essential nutrients for men's health. She'll call you Mr. C. And the, not, you say don't wear fucking caps. Right? But if the shoe, if the shoe did fit, you say it's large, you should have laced it up and go live last. I don't wait for get drunk or come and talk about black people and coolie people and this and that and all kind of scunt on your morning live. Whole morning, you calling me name?